All right. Thanks for being back on time once again. Sandy Kumar is joining us from Uber. Sandy, is uh, your appearance here maybe an announcement of Uber's expansion into Serbian market? I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> Sorry? I don't mean to, to, to put you on the okay. spot, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe talk to guys higher yeah. up. Let's Good talk luck. later, yeah. All right. Hey, folks. Welcome. Uh, today, we are going to see about building reactive microservices and running on Kubernetes. I know the title is very long, and it also has a lot of elements. And each one of those elements, it could take one full talk for us to cover. So we're just going to see overview of everything and understand how it works. And also, I'll give a demo of how J-Hipster or K-Hipster works. So a little bit about me. I'm Sandil. I'm an engineering manager building payments at Uber. And that's what I do. And in the agenda today, what we're going to see is like, why microservices? Why does it matter? Why do you have to use it? And then why Kubernetes? And where does it help you? And why you have to go reactive? And finally, what is K-Hipster and how you can use it to generate the application? And a little demo if everything goes well. So let's start with why microservices. Does anybody willing to answer this question? Why microservices? Why do you think we need to have it? Any volunteers? No? OK. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, scalability, extensibility. That's awesome. Great. Cool. Which are basically my points, so thanks for stealing that away. But yeah, microservices are becoming the de facto standard in the industry. A lot of companies are trying to build their services and go in the direction of microservices because of a lot of benefits it offers. And a lot of nightmares, too, right? It comes with its own. And these services are isolated and independent components that run all by itself. And it provides that granular scalability for you. So each of the services, you can scale in and scale out, or whatever you want to do, scale up and scale down, as you need it, those services, and as the resources are needed. And finally, these services are fault tolerant. In the sense, when one of these services goes away, when one of these services are not working, you can safely kick that service away, and still the end application work with reduced functionality. And that is the coolest thing that could happen. Because previously, in the world of monoliths, if something goes wrong, your NTS services might go wrong. But here, only a portion of your service is going wrong. So those are the fundamental benefits of going towards microservices. And when you think about microservices, you always think about those little services does one thing, and it does it well. You test it, you do it, you develop it in isolation, you deliver and deploy that in isolation, but make sense that it has to do that one thing particularly well. And when you're designing it, it's very important that you should avoid a single point of failure. Sometimes it might creep in, but it's very essential that you have to be very proactive there and avoid that single point of failure. When you have one, then you are signing up a lot of nightmares in the world of microservices. So that's microservices, right? Why do we need something like Kubernetes? How does it fit in that particular scale? So let's go through a little story here. So every service that you have, let's consider that they're owning their own data. So they have their own data. It can be a database. It can be a domain model. It can be anything. But they own that particular data. And I would like to see those things as contracts, where like each of the services establish a contract, saying, like, hey, I'm having these kind of API contracts. You can request this and get me the data in the format of that. And all these services interact and talk with each other. It's as simple as that. Like when you have multiple services, all those things are going to talk with each other. But when the scale emerges out, when you have a huge scale where like you scale out to hundreds and thousands of services, then the complexity arises. How these connections are going to work out? For example, how do you know whether the service that you want to reach is running or not? What is, who's going to tell you that? And how can you scale those services individually? Like, providing one service as, for example, a user service to 100 instances, and then other product service to 5, 10 instances. How you can do that? And how will you know whether a particular service is running or not? I think it's basically the same thing. But it's basically saying, like, how, if a service is not running, how can I go and retry? And how can I build those services together? And how can I update a config? For example, your data center has been hacked, and you have changed something in your data center, like the way of connecting and things like that. Do you have to completely down your application or the products that you're giving in order to build that up? How can you upgrade that little password that expired? 
Those kind of things are complicated in the world of microservices. And that's where Kubernetes comes to help you. So Kubernetes helps to build, deploy, and scale the containerized applications or the services. That's what it does. And in the world of like, how can you know whether the service is running or not? It has things like load balancing and service discovery. Service discovery is just a register, which kind of knows for a particular service where to go and reach and how to connect those service. And Kubernetes helps you with that. And for scaling, Kubernetes also does this automatic scaling based on some condition. For example, if your resource is 70% or 80%, spin up new services. Those kind of things, Kubernetes does it automatically. And that's where Kubernetes helps you out. And it also has this automated monitoring and stopping of services. For example, if it's just a Docker container, Docker doesn't know anything about it. If the process inside the Docker container has been finished, it just quits it. But in the world of containerized application, you need someone externally monitoring whether a particular service is live and it's ready for accepting connections. These kind of things are done by Kubernetes by itself, which makes it much more simpler for us to use it. And Kubernetes also comes up with secret and config management that enables us to you know, change passwords, change the configuration, change certificates, whatever the thing that is required using that. So it's great, right? Like you have Kubernetes and a lot of containerized application on top of it. Everything works well. Let's call it a day. But it's not like that. Like the moment you enter into the world of microservices, a lot of nightmares come into it. And we just replaced all the function calls inside a monolith with network calls. And that's a huge mistake because network is slow. And it buffers a lot, which basically means you're on a reliable fun from a reliable function call, you just moved into unreliable network call, and that makes it a problem. So for example, for your services to communicate with each other, it's not possible for them to do it faster and more reliable, and that is a bigger problem that you're going to face. So that's only in the case of two services. What if there are multiple services? For example, in this case, a service has to go and connect with another service. Let's consider the latency is 50 milliseconds. And then it goes and gets the data. Based on that data, it goes and calls another service. Let's say it has 100 millisecond latency. And finally, it goes and calls a third service with all the data that they aggregated, and then formulates the last data, and then gives it back to the client. So the total latency of this round trip is 170 milliseconds, which is a sum of all those latencies. These are just three services we are talking about. What if there are hundreds of services? It kind of exponentially grows. But you can solve this in a similar way where using something like this, where you issue all the requests at the same time to those different services and build it. In this case, the amount of latency that it's going to get is 100 milliseconds, which is the maximum of time for any two services to talk. That maximum time is where, where it has to wait. And in industry, we call this as non-blocking asynchronous communication. And this kind of helps you out, and it makes it easier for you to connect those services and not too much worry about latencies that gets added up ex exponentially when there are a number of services there. So we can use this and make our application faster, hopefully. And that's where Reactive comes into picture. This Reactive applications makes it much more simpler in order to not using the blocking stuffs, but just go non-blocking way and then get your applications faster. So with Reactive, you can have highly interactive and fast experience for your users. You can build consistent and reliable experience. The resiliency is very high. You can use Reactive principles or Reactive services to make sure that you're having consistent and reliable experience. You can scale even more dynamically because the Reactive kind of has this elasticity that kind of allows you to scale dynamically. And the most important of it all and the most important in terms of money and monetary stuff, you can have lesser resource utilization. And that is very, very important in this world. So where you kind of pay less for your cloud services, but you get more out of the compute engines that you're putting it out there. And that's where Reactive helps you out. And Reactive services are basically built on top of Reactive Manifesto, which basically has four principles. The first one is responsive, which basically says whatever you put out there it's always going to give you an when you ask for a question to it, it will always give you an answer to it. That's how it's like you will get a response faster and better. And resiliency is basically like it recovers quickly. For example, if there is some failure, it understands, oh, there is a failure that happened. I'm going to short circuit this resource and this call, 
and then give the response back as an error or something. Again, resilience here means it can throw back an error, but on the other hand, it resolves it quickly and goes it to the mother service. And it also promises elasticity, which is basically you can dynamically scale stuff. You can have a lot of instances that comes in, but the elasticity will be there, which basically means like even at a scale, it delivers output. And finally, it's message driven, which is basically message in, message out. Everything that you're going to do in a reactive world, uh, it's basically a message in and message out. You're putting a message somewhere and retrieving a message somewhere else. That's how it's going to work. So that is Reactive Manifesto, and all the reactive services work on top of Reactive Manifesto. But when you're designing a reactive microservices, it is important for you to understand that all the components in your architecture, so consider this is your entire architecture, all the components in that architecture should be reactive. If one of the components is not reactive, then it makes it difficult, or you kind of cannot get all the benefits that we talked before, like the elasticity, like the resiliency and everything, you cannot get it if one part of your system is not completely reactive. So it's very important for us to make sure all the components are reactive. And most important of all, reactive microservices is not for everybody. If you are dealing with like 50 to 100 or 200 requests per second, you need not think about reactive microservices. You can just go ahead with normal microservices and work your way out. But when you're thinking about like 750 requests per second or more than that, just a random number there, but some books refer them as 750 and some places it referred like more than that. But again, like when the number of requests that you're dealing for a second is much, much higher, then you think about building reactive microservices or else it's not worth the amount of complication that you're getting inside by going reactive. And whenever we talk about reactive, one particular library pops up. That is Rx Java, and the reactive libraries in Rx, Java, JS, and whatever it is, kind of helped us to make sure in a much more simpler way to build those reactive systems and reactive-based applications. It makes it easier. And, but how can you build a service with just Rx Java? You cannot do it, right? And that's where Spring comes into picture. Uh, how many of you are Java developers here? Okay, you have quite a few. Okay, so I hope you all know about Spring, and Spring helps you to uh, Spring helps you to make sure your application is much more easier to build, and all those uh, ex benefits that it brings in inside here. And also, Spring Fix is going to come with Java 17 as a base version. That's also awesome. So Spring is there, which kind of revolutionized how we develop Java applications. There are a lot of tools available today, but back in the day, it was the only thing. And then Spring Boot came in, and it kind of simplified a lot of process that we have done in Spring. And that's, for example, this is one code. It's a normal Java code, and also like it doesn't have anything extra specific. It's very simple code. But this is how you do a request mapping, or a resource, or write a controller in Java, where the post mapping is specified as a post call for the slash users endpoint. And so this function is create user, which gets an user as an object. Again, you see those two annotations, like at valid and at request body. It basically makes, simplifies everything. You need not care about anything. Like, you can have this validation rules, and also you can have this uh, at request body, which simplifies how you can um, do all the validations that is required for that object, and also how the structure of object should be there. And then in the next step, you're going to go ahead and take that user, do some preprocessor, do some handling of errors, and then you go and save that thing to your repository service. That's basically it. And then finally, you get a result back. You send that result back to the, uh, back to the users with enclosing them in a response entity. And that is what is happening here. And that's what Spring Boot does. Like, it makes it magical. It also makes, eliminates a lot of things that you have to rewrite every now and then. And then Spring Reactive came along the way, which kind of helps you to build reactive application on top of Spring which makes it easier, and uh, get, getting all the benefits of Spring Boot and everything that we had, and put it on top, add reactive to, it, reactive to it, and that's what Spring Reactive is all about. It's built on Project Reactor, and the Project Reactor has two concepts. One is Mono, and the other one is Flow. And this is like, there are a lot of different things inside here, but at an overall high-level point of view, these are the two main important things. And first, Mono says, hey, I am just an object. I could emit zero or one value. Basically, I can emit one object out of me, 
or I can emit a null object out of me. That's what Luna is all about. And then Flow says, I am a list. I can be zero or more. I can, I can also be one, but I'm a list. I'm an array list kind of structure where you're expecting a list from it. And that, those are the two important things, differences. And here, in this case, if you're going to convert this into reactive, the very first thing that you have to do is wrap your object, which is user in our case. We are going to wrap that user object into mono, which basically says, here, I can either throw an error with a null value or throw a user object. That is only one user object via that. Everything else remains same. And then I've written that object, the saved value, and then I map it into the response entity. And then finally, I throw that object away. And that's simple it is. Like a code that is basically that you have written on non-reactive world, you can just pipe it to reactive world and just do a little modification. And that kind of helps you make your application reactive. So this is a whole code that we can have. On the other hand, you can move further. And Kotlin makes it much more sweeter, because Kotlin is a very concise language. And it makes it much more sweeter by Converting those elements, a little things that you have, the same code in a Kotlin version here. See there, the fun is out there. And then you're getting an object. I haven't specified the return value here, and I've just put an equal to here, which basically helps you to, uh, which basically automatically puts that return value for you. And then I do the same sort of functionalities. And I did a little bit of you know, uh, sugar syntax, or however you want to call it, by those, all those pink things that you can see on the slide is basically the sugar syntax that I've added, which basically makes the code much cleaner and also very smaller. That depends on the perspective. And so Kotlin is awesome, right? So everybody loves Kotlin. So we can say, like, what are the benefits of Kotlin? The first and foremost, everybody that will come and talk is null safety. Null safety is there, which is great. It's less verbose. So basically, you don't need to put all those typing and everything. It automatically detects typing for you. And then coroutines with structured concurrencies is a bigger thing that is talked, and everybody loves Kotlin because of that. And it's also expressive and a concise language. And finally, it's hacky and a very fun language. So you can have Kotlin script, you can convert this Kotlin into multi-platform and everything. So those are the advantages of having Kotlin. But Java people come and say, hey, we are catching up on verbal stuff. VAR is already available, so the detection of automatic type inference is there. So we are catching up on that. Coredence Project Loom in Java, which will be released 17 and 17 plus, will also address the Coredence stuff, which is basically does are not benefits anymore on using Kotlin over Java. And being expressive and concise is personal preference. Some of you might like Java because it's much more clear. Some of you might like Kotlin because it's much more smaller. Those are prefer personal preferences. And the only thing that you have to worry about, or only advantage that you're getting by going into Kotlin is null safety. And if you're programming in Java, and if you're programming with your eyes open, you could prevent those things too. So it's basically up to your personal choice on what you have to take. And that's why Kotlin. And basically moving to the next stage is why Kotlin hipster or k-hipster. So k-hipster is written on top of j-hipster. It's, it's exactly the j-hipster stuff, but it's written on top the only thing that changed between jhipster and khipster is the Kotlin. And uh, it's an open source app generator that helps you to de develop full stack apps from the scratch. And uh, it is, we, I would like to call it as a development platform because it gives you all the bells and whistles that you want to have in your application. That is basically generates everything that is required for your application to work along. So how you can use it? It's as simple as that. You go ahead and install your NPM module, which is NPM generator jhipster Kotlin. You create a directory, go to that directory, and run the khipster command. And what it does is like it basically asks you a bunch of questions with which you can decide what kind of application you want. You want a monolith application or a microservice. You want to have a reactive application or non-reactive application. What kind of authentication would you like to have, like OAuth-based, JWT token-based, and things like that? It also supports a wide variety of databases. Uh, you can choose between Maven and Gradle. You can also choose web frameworks, Vue, React, Angular, or whatever it is there. Swell is also there. And you can also determine like what are the continuous uh, CI and CD tools that you want to integrate with, or you want to use Kubernetes and Istio together. So it kind of gives you that options. You can pick them together, 
it just builds a framework. Like the output that it's going to generate is a normal best practices followed JVM plus uh, your web code. That's basically it. Nothing fancy over there. It just creates everything for you so that you can go ahead and modify it as you need it and work with it as you need it. So let's go to the demo. I hope there is something here. Yeah. So in, in jhipster or khipster, you can generate application using something called JDL, where you put everything that you want to generate in that file and then ask the a generator to generate this thing. So here I'm going to generate a microservice application. I hope it's visible. Let me zoom in a bit. So here I'm going to generate a microservice application. So this is my first application where I give some information to it. So I say like, okay, this is application is called a store, and it will be a gateway. I'm using a gateway pattern here. So I'm using gateway, my package name, and I'm also using a service discovery. I'm using a database Postgres, some cache provider build tool, and I'm also using React as my client framework. And I'm, the one word that I'm saying is, okay, it's going to use a reactive framework. That's basically it, and it sets to true. And similarly, I, can, I have generated multiple things here. So product, which is a microservice, which has the same concept. And then I have the third application, which is invoice, which is again a microservice, which also uses a Postgres. And finally, the fourth application that I have is notification which is, again, a microservice, but it, it's using MongoDB instead of Postgres. So every container or every service that I'm putting together out there is going to have its own spin-up of database. And that's basically it. And I've also, I can also go ahead and define all the database entities that I would like to have. So for example, I can have a customer entity and put everything over there. I can have the relationship between those entities, and I can also define them together here. So customer is defined or related to user. So you kind of like put everything together that your application needs, and then you go ahead and generate those applications. If you have generated those applications, you'll have this one, two, three, and four folders, and all those as a normal spring-based application, nothing fancy in here. You have your Gradle, you have source, you have Webpack and everything. So again, like source, inside source, you have Kotlin, and then it's a normal, basic Spring application. Nothing fancy here, uh, but it just helps you to run your applications together. So everything is built for you, and you can just run the services to see how the services work. So that's how you can generate. So let's go ahead and that's, that's not the fun part of it. Like, let's go ahead and generate a Kubernetes thing here. So I'm going to create a folder, Kubernetes. Let me also zoom in a bit. And then I'm going to say Kubernetes, Kubernetes, khipster, with a keyword Kubernetes there. And what it does is like it just uses, it just reads the config file if I have something, and then asks me a bunch of questions. And this is how the normal workflow for you if you're running jhipster or khipster. So I'm going to generate the Kubernetes configuration for a microservice application. So I've chosen that. It asks me where the folder, where my services are. Again, these are services that is generated by jhipster. So I'm going to select all the services for which I want to generate the Kubernetes configuration. And uh, it asks me whether I want to set up a monitoring. I'm saying no for now, for this demo. And also, it understood that my application has a MongoDB in it. Do I have to create a cluster database there? I'm just going to say no here. And then it goes about, like, what are the things that you want to use in the Kubernetes world? What is the namespace that you want to use? And then uh, what is your Docker repository name? that you're going to use, and how you're going to use your Docker push and things like that. Whether you want to enable Istio for this demo, I'm saying no, but you can also add it. And what type of Kubernetes service type that you would like. A load balancer, which gives you an IP. A node port, which just exposes a random port. And ingress, you can basically create ingress services. This is basically what is recommended for production use case. But here, for the demo, let's go for load balancer. And that's basically it. It generates all the file for you. And also, it gives you a list of instructions here. Basically, like, hey, create your uh, Docker images from those services. And once you've created those Docker images, push those things to your repository, Docker Hub. And then finally, run this command to run it on Kubernetes. Let's see what the code has been generated here. Let me open that. As you can see here, it's this folder structure. It's also exactly the same where like you have 
a Kubernetes configuration for each and every application that you have generated. And let's just go through the store, which is our main gateway, which has the Postgres YAML file. And you can here you can see like it just like Postgres, uh, what is the password there, what the particular deployment, where it can go and fetch the image, and all those things. So it basically deploys the Postgres Docker image, Docker container on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and that's basically it. And then finally, you have this deployment, which is your application. So here, you're just bundling that Java-based or Kotlin-based application that you've created into your Docker container, and then putting that inside the Kubernetes. So we call that as a deployment in the Kubernetes world. And my pod here is basically a simple container that goes and listens for DB to up. Once the DB is up, it fetches the image from the store, which is the name of the image, which I'm going to put it in Docker Hub. And it fetches, it takes in environment variables, and then it just runs it over there. There are two important things that you can see here, which is specific to Kubernetes world. And that's basically like readiness probe and liveness probe. So a readiness probe is basically make sure like it goes and hits that endpoint every now and then once the container is starting to figure out whether the particular application or service that you put in is ready or not. If it's ready, then it says, yes, it's ready. You can go ahead and service that thing. And liveness probe is exactly the other thing where like it checks for the heartbeat from the containers and sees like whether your application is running. So Kubernetes uses these two signals to maintain or to start and stop the services that you're putting inside Kubernetes. So that's why it is important. You have two endpoints which it goes and reaches out and checks whether you have 200 coming out of it. If the 200 is not there for the HTTP status code response, then it goes ahead and reboot the server or reboot the containers that is running inside there. So that's how it works. And then you have service. Service is nothing but it just exposes. So you can consider service in the Kubernetes world as kind of a layer or load balancer on top of your service itself. So your Docker container, which is a deployment running inside the Kubernetes mission, and then you can have service, which is outside, that kind of like exposes your service to the external world. Here, since we have defined it as a load balancer, it kind of exposes there, so you will have an IP address available. And that's, that's basically what is gonna happen in across all the places. Same for product, same for notification, and same for invoice. And that's how it has been configured. Again, all those things are pretty much basic. If you're writing it from ground up, you will end up writing something similar to this. So what you're getting is like you're getting the final state beforehand, and you can go ahead and modify as you need it. That's basically what's what's helpful. And also, it's helpful to show that in demo. That's basically it. So once I have done this, all I have to do is like just go ahead and create a container or a Kubernetes cluster anywhere and then just deploy them. Uh, I know demos won't go what. So I have already created that container. So there is this container that is available. Uh, all you have to do is just run, sorry, I'm switching back and forth. But all you have to do is just run this command, which is kubectl. All you have to do is just run this command, kubectl dash f. This is basically what you have to run to run this entire script and also deploy all your applications. So if you go to your Kubernetes cluster, you could see the workloads here, which is basically all the services that we have seen. So all of them are inside the namespace that I've created. And you have seen, you, you have like application invoice and invoice PostgreSQL, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and then notification, notification DB, and then product and store, and all those databases configured. So all those things are there. You have exposed three services here. So you will see uh, more than three services, but all of them is basically like uh, here. Let me check. Yeah, so you will have the store service, and the store service is the only one that we have exposed as a load balancer. So you have an external IP available to it. For the, all the other services that we have defined here, for example, the product service, we haven't specified it as a load balancer, but only on the store service we have said, hey, it's load balancer. So it just exposed that particular service. So now I could just go to this URL, which opens up the application for me. This is a generic application that is generated. And let me try logging in here. Yeah, you can also access it, the same point, it's available. So this is what you have seen here. And then all the entities that you've created, for example, the user, 
and all those entities, you have this thing here. So you can go ahead and create those entities, all those pages, all those CRUD operation is basically created for you. So you can add those things that is required. And then you can go ahead and save it. So you can, you have the same thing. So all this CRUD operation like view, edit, and all those things are available. So you can, if you just want to use it, you can use it. And it also basically has all those validations. For example, some entities you can create a validation like the minimum length and maximum length. It also uses that. So that's basically it. With that, I'm going to jump back to the keynote. So we have seen what are microservices, how splitting your big service into smaller chunks helps, and Kubernetes, how it helps you to scale and manage the services, Reactive, how it makes things faster and resilient for you, and Khipster makes it easier, faster to develop. And a final demo, that's what we have seen so far. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, dots. Thanks a lot for your time.